Robinson and I'm an aeromodeler and an engineer. Join me on a fascinating journey where I show you some of the techniques used in scale aeromodeling. Okay, so it's had 24 hours to dry. What I'm going to try and do now is see if I can actually get that off. <laughs> there could be swearing involved in this video. I was of course quite nervous that this wouldn't come off. But, um, I had hoped it would come off easier than this. It is going straight back down to shape again. It's not lifting it and bending it and creasing it or anything like that. It is actually lifting okay. However, that's proving harder than I expected. All, all, all of this is probably damaging the blue foam underneath. So I think this is going, if, I, if this doesn't work, then I've probably got to start again. And apply new blue foam and reshape it and everything. So I'm just hoping I don't crack it. I think we might be winning. I'm hoping all this cracking noise is not actually this glass fibre bit breaking. Well, it doesn't look like it is, maybe it's just the tape underneath. And there we go. And it's not very firm, not very rigid. So I think it needed to be like that to allow me to get it off. It had to flex a little bit to get it off. Um, but it also needs to be more rigid to, to form the next part. That goes on there like that. And I'm going to apply another coat of quite heavy glass on top of that because now that I know it will release. Um, yeah, I think that should work. So anyway, there we go. There's the, uh, that line there, should line up on that one there. Yeah, see that it's just springing in a little bit. But it, that's, that's no biggie actually because the way it's held on is probably with magnets and screws. So I can squeeze it together and drill the holes for the screws and, and it'll be fine, I think. So here we go. This is 160 gram cloth. And you can see I've taped down and protected the edges of the, uh, of the area. And what I'm going to do is just put two, two layers of the 160 gram on top of that just to stiffen it up. As you can see, it's conforming to the shape really easily. This is a woven ply, uh, a woven, a woven uh, cloth. And uh, it's sticking down nicely. It's going into the, uh, the radius nicely and it's it's sticking down. Um, if you find that your cloth is lifting at the edges and won't stay put, it, it's probably because it seems to have some sort of spring in the uh, cloth. And that's usually a sign that it's not a particularly good cloth. And uh, th this cloth I'm using here is from East Coast Fiberglass, um, who I found a, a very helpful, very good. The only, you know, the, the cloth is, is nice and cheap. Um, but it's a good quality and it also, um, well, the, the, the main drawback is, it, is, is shipping costs because a big roll of fiberglass cloth, uh, it, it gets delivered by a courier so it's, um, so the shipping costs are a little bit high so, uh, so you have to get a few rolls of it. I always have an excuse to, uh, to buy more supplies, but um, there we go. So um, I, think I might need to mix more resin for this, for two coats. One might be enough, but I've, I've cut the other one, so two will definitely be good. 
but I've used over half of it already on just one side. Right, I'll do the other side. You can't really see that because of the camera angle. So uh, I'll do the other side and then we'll uh, we'll come back later. Okay, so we've now, we've now got another piece of 160 gram cloth ready to go on. And I've mixed up another seven grams of, of resin. Well, actually it ends up at uh, about 10 grams by the time you've had the resin and the catalyst together. Because it's a two and a half to one ratio by weight. This should give us a nice solid mould. Hopefully won't need any support. You can just lay up the piece inside it and uh, and where we go. These brushes are what's called Jenny brushes. Well, these are these are not real Jenny brushes. Um, these are a, a clone of, of the Jenny brush, the original Jenny brush, and it's basically a polyurethane foam that has a nylon stiffener down the middle, a piece of nylon plastic, to give it some rigidity, otherwise they, it would flex too much. Um, and they, they work really well. Um, they're especially good for when you're doing varnishing and lacquering because there's no way you can shed a bristle. But what you do have to watch is if you're painting or using um, a solvent based paint and it's pretty powerful solvent such as a cellulose, it'll actually melt the foam and you, you, you won't get bristles You'll get bits of foam in your in your job so um, worth noting just be careful with the with the solvent that's in your paint and as the previous layer I'll turn the recording off now and I'll go and do the other side we'll be back in a little while well it's been a few hours since this went on and because it's over the top of something reasonably rigid already, I think we can probably have a go at trying to get this off. There's a bit of flex in it as well, which might uh, might be helpful, but it's not. It's still tacky. So, um, no, actually, that's flexing too much. I'm not happy with that. We'll leave it till tomorrow. So as you can see that popped off, it still needs to be trimmed around the edges. What I'm going to do, because it's still, I, I only glassed it this morning so it's only been about six hours, which is a bit short. So it's still a bit cheesy, I would have said. It's dry to the touch, but it's still a bit soft. So I'm just going to clamp these two little sections here that seem to want to lift a little bit. I'll just clamp them down. While the um, while it hardens off, and uh, I'll take another look at it tomorrow, and uh, it should be nice and fresh and dry, and you know, uh, really, really hard then, really firm, uh, and then I can trim the shape that I actually want, flip it over, um, put some PVA release agent and some various stuff inside to 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 allow the the glass to pop out, and we'll um, we'll cast a panel. So it's been a few a few more hours, and uh, the uh, the section is now firm enough. I've marked off where I want to cut it, so uh, I'm going to use my new cutting disc in the Dremel, and it's um, it's a permagrit sort of disc, which I've never tried one of these before, and we'll see how it goes. I'm hoping it's not uh, so aggressive. I'll try it on the back first, where it doesn't really matter too much. Anyway, here we go.
And there we go. That's the panel trim to size. Now you can see the ridges inside, and I am quite worried about these as to what's going to happen when I lay that up, uh, and whether or not it will re release because of the uh, the ridges. But anyway, that's the panel. We'll see how we get on with that, shall we? So we'll give this a go. The inside of this is still a bit a bit ridged and rough, and I am worried that I won't be able to get the glass part out of this, which will which be a real pain. But I'm going to give it a go anyway, just to see what we can do. So what I'm going to put in there, this is from my Marigon Arts and Crafts uh, company. They're, they're the people I get a lot of my um, silicon resins and chemicals from. Um, and this is a PVA release agent. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to paint a coat on the inside of this. Remember that this part doesn't need to be particularly good. Uh, and I could almost use this part to make my my um, my part and uh, see if we can get it to actually let go. That's uh, the idea of this is that the resin won't stick to it and it'll form a barrier. So uh, I'm going to make sure I get it completely covered. Now normally I'd spray this, but I, I actually want a fairly thorough coat on this. And fortunately it's blue, so you can see where you've painted and where you haven't. So, um, and then I propose to lay up two layers of this 160 gram cloth inside here. So I'll end up with a part that is nearly as thick as this. That, um, Probably about half the thickness of this, and that will uh, that should be more than enough. So I say I just I hope this will work, but uh, but I am winging it a bit. Never done it before, so I don't know what will happen. Usually the um, the mold is polished really really highly, and then waxed and and then waxed and then waxed and then waxed and polished some more. So the fact that this mold is not polished, it's just rough. Well, it's not really rough, it's, uh, but as, it, as I made it, as it was cast, the PVA has probably got a lot of work to do to try and release the part, but we'll, we'll give it a go. Now I could let that dry and then give it another coat, but I think because it's a nice thick coat, we might be all right. But I'm going to let it dry anyway. And, uh, and then we'll try and do a layup inside that. And fingers crossed. All right. More soon. Well, welcome back. We're into another day. What I'm doing now is I'm just going to mix up some more resin, and uh, we'll get cracking with laying up a couple of couple of layers of 160 gram cloth inside the mold. It's, I've had uh, I put a coat of PVA release agent inside the mold. And uh, we'll, we'll see how we get on. This might be an interesting little uh, tip for you guys. The um, Fire Tracers L285 resin is mixed at a 2.5 to 1 ratio by weight. And my mental arithmetic is rubbish. Um, the, at the moment of trying to mix it, um, um, I, I struggle to, <laughs> to work out the ratios. So what I've done is I've just printed a little sheet that tells me how much resin I pour into the pot. In grams and then that sort of gives me a ratio of how many grams of catalyst. I know it's simple and, and obvious but if you just put it inside the lid of your scales or stick it on the wall or something you've got a really quick reference and you don't have to think oh did I calculate that right or anything else because the fire tracers L285 resin is quite quite sensitive to the to the ratio. If you get it wrong it'll still work but um, if you get it more than say a gram out or well, it would be a percentage, I guess it's probably a better way of doing it, but I don't know what the percentage would be. But you have to be fairly accurate. If you're not, then it'll either take a long time to set or it just won't set at all. And I have been there. So um, so this is why I try to be quite accurate. Uh, I'm struggling with the scales at the moment because sometimes they don't seem to want to start reading until you put a couple of grams in. And I want it to be more precise than that. My old scales were much better, but um, this new one, I may, I may have to go and try and find a, another set of the old ones. Anyway, let's crack on. So 
that should have been four grams and I'm at 4.1. I think that'll be okay. And I've done 10 grams to four grams. Give that a good stir. So this could get a bit messy, so I'm going to put gloves on. And here we go. Now what I'm seeing here is that these edges are standing up so they're not laying flat against the mould. So what I'm going to do is something I don't like doing but um, I think I'm going to have to do in this instant and that's put weights on the edges. So I'm just going to put that paper one on top of the other because it's got some resin on it. Stand that like that. These are just ordinary, uh, <clears throat> what I call bulldog clips. And I'm just going to use them to add a bit of weight on the edges. As you can see, they're just pulling the cloth down to make sure it's in contact with the with these flanges. It might have been better to use two layers and, and um, just let it harden off between the layers rather than do what I've done and see how that goes. We may not be able to get it out of the flipping mould and, <laughs> and then that may be the end of the game anyway. All right, as soon as that sets, we'll give it a day. But certainly till this evening and we'll see how that's gone. So what I'm looking at now is I'm just going to make the top section of the tailplane cone that goes under the rudder. So first of all I need to make a litho plate um, plate which is the right outline shape and then on top of that I'm then going to add some foam, some blue foam and I'm going to sculpt it down to, uh, to meet the rest of it. And I'm not worried that there'll be a demarcation between the lith and the and the foam because the whole thing's going to get painted anyway and we can probably fill it to a certain extent. So what I want to do, I've made I've, um, I've made this drawing from my 
three view um, so that I know what I need and now all I'm going to do is um, draw around this and then that's going to be my cut part I'm just going to put a little mark on it as well I know where the centre line is that could be useful okay so now what we do is we cut that out in fact I'm going to draw that centre line on there because we do need it so, um, And now we'll cut this out. And if you remember, whenever I cut the fill plate, I don't actually cut through it. I score it. Now the interesting thing about this is these two sections are straight with a radius. And then these are also straight, but they taper from the tailplane leading edge. have the waste side of the cut if you use scissors to the outside because this bit will deform this bit hopefully won't I'm going to do the same trick that I normally do in that I'll cut to the edge of the line and then I'll sand to the line even not even though it's a litho plate it will still sand Okay, I'm going to go try that on the model, just see where we need to put. There's a raised ridge along here, which I'll do with my dapping tools, and I'll show you that in a second. But let's first of all see where this is going to be on the fuselage. Okay, so this section here, you can see now why I put the center line on it. In fact, I'm going to have to cut a bit out of the middle there to clear the rudder post. So it needs to be that deep and that wide just to clear the rudder torque rod. So I'll just make a little snip. Unfortunately making a cut like that does distort the litho a little bit but it's it's out of the way so we won't, we won't be so bad. So that's about the... now remember I had the centre line drawn on it and this is one of the reasons. So. That's where it's going to go, but we have this raised section here that we need to accommodate. So I'll put a mark on it, on the plate where I want the centre of that ridge to be. And it's going to run straight across there. And what I'm going to do is actually lose a little bit of that end. So I think what I'll do is I'll offset it slightly couple of mils this side because I want the back to be in the right place but because of this lifting you know the, the radius or the distance is going to be greater because it's got to go over the ridge so I'm going to shift that to that end that'll make that end just a little bit too short but this is all going to get covered in in foam and filler anyway okay so if we come back over here I'm just going to add a little bit a couple of mil to that line and then that is the center line of the raised hump. So let's go get the dappy blocks, tools, and we'll put that ridge in. These are the dapping tools, lots of different rounded sections or steel. And you've got lots of cubes with, with radius holes in, you get blocks with ridges, all sorts of stuff like that. And then you get uh, you know, bigger sections um, so for creating this we could use 
that trough there but I'm actually going to use one of the troughs on this and I want a radius one and I think it's that one that I used and then what I used was a a dapping radius end that was the same diameter as that okay and what you do is you just place it in there and then you run it up and down and gradually you form it so I think I want it this way up so I'm going to transfer that line so that needs to be centered on that line there and then we find our dapping tool and we simply go up and down force the litho plate gently and straight into that hole, into that uh, trough. And there we have a crooked <laughs> That didn't go as well as I hoped. Let me see if I can pull that back a bit. So this side needs to come that way a little bit. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to do this, but uh, we'll give it a go. If you get it wrong, you get it wrong, and I've got it wrong. That's better. So I have managed to straighten it out a little bit. I'll put a couple of little creases in there which I don't want. So I'm just going to flatten those out. And there we go. That should do us. I'm just going to try that on the model. Okay. That goes to there, and then my line has ended up just still a little bit too short, but on this model, I don't think they'll worry too much. Now, what I do need to do is I need to find that screw hole. So, the screw hole should be between there. And there so it should be right about there so I'm going to make a hole there for that screw to go through okay so how would you make that hole there's your question for the day well you could drill it but it would distort this is how I'm going to do it I'm going to use a permagret needle file and just spin it Now as it wanders to one side or the other, I apply side pressure as I'm spinning it to keep it on track. Now if your finger dexterity isn't so great, what you can do is you could put this on a piece of 16th ply or some or 32nd ply and then use the ply to hold it rigidly while you do it. A nice neat round hole. Right, just to do the last bit, I've got a cone shaped tape uh, to permagrip. over that like that and then it all aligns up on the center line so 
so that's good. So now I need to just check my my drawings. And there are screw holes all the way around the edge of this. So I'm going to check my my photographs and mark where those screw holes are going to be and then drill holes in the litho plate at those points to add simulated screws. I could actually, and this might be a good idea, I might use my riveting technique where I punch from the underside where the screw heads are going to be, uh, but make them slightly larger than these and, and then make little nicks in the top of the dent so that they look like screw heads. So I think I might do that and that might be better. So I'm, I'll check the drawing or check the photographs, mark on here where the dots are, and then I'm going to make another tool like this for doing the rivets, but it's going to be a larger diameter. So let's see how that goes. So what I've done is I've created a slightly larger rivet tool, which is a piece of piano wire with a rounded end on it. And there's a matching brass tube, which is flattened at the end and filed flush to create the, um, the effect of these screws. So what I've done is I've punched quite hard from the back and it was quite a firm punch this time, much more than I would with rivets on that side to mark all of these. And then on the top surface, I've used this with a very gentle tap to give the impression of the outer edge of the, um, of the screws. So that's those two done. Now, to, to create, and you possibly can't see it, but to create the impression of a slot, all I'm doing is putting a scalpel tip on top of the dimple in the middle, and then I'm just tapping it with one of the dapping tools. And I'm not sure that you'll be able to even see that, but that has now created, where are we? Yeah, there. So that has now created a little slot. And they are just slotted screws on the full size. So I'll just keep doing that. And there we go. Whether that's actually visible or, or not is... Well, it'll do. It'll do. Okay, so what we're, we're doing now, we're moving on to the... Uh, we're, we're still on the telcone, rather. Um, so what I've done is I've made a foam block and I've measured the height that I need to uh, to make it, and I've cut it. So this this block should fit straight underneath the rudder and go above that curved lift plate panel that we've just fitted. So what I'm what I've done is I've marked off the outline of the rudder and the outline of the shape of the fairing as it meets the litho plate base. So what I've got to do is I've got to radius from that line to that line. So over that height there, I've got to put a perfect radius in all the way around. Uh, this tail bit here will actually be rounded. You can see the pencil line where that's actually gonna, gonna follow. So I'll round this off and then I've got to put a radius on all of this all the way around those three sides. And then this edge goes under the, goes up against the fin. And that'll get us most of the, the fairing shape. There's some bulges and lumps and bumps along here that um, are to allow clearance for the rudder horns on the full size. My rudder horn is, is done via a torque rod underneath, so it's not needed. But the bulges obviously have to be replicated. Now, I could try and replicate them in the foam just here, but it's probably going to be easier to radius this all the way around and then add the little blocks uh, the lumps afterwards and this will all get um, covered in a in 25 gram cloth glass cloth just to give it some strength there will be a hole down through the middle there for the bolt and there was and i'll do it in a minute there's going to be a notch just there as we saw for the litho plate to clear the torque rod for the uh, for the rudder actuation so the next step is to round that off cut that little notch there um, and then try and radius this section here. I could mount it to the to the litho plate actually on the tail plane and do it there, but because of those little screws I put around the edges, they're going to get in the way of the sanding. So I'm going to sand this on the bench, and then I'll attach this to that once it's once it's the right shape.
I think you get the idea of where this is going. We'll come back to it in a minute when I've finished. So here's the uh, the finished article. It'll slip in there like that. And then it um, goes like that. And that gives us the, uh, the shroud. Now what I'm going to do is use, um, I'm going to cover that in fiberglass, glass cloth. And then I'm going to run a bead of filler down the middle of that once the glass cloth has um, has hardened off to try and uh, blend that in a little bit. I wish I hadn't done the raised screws now, uh, but I have. So uh, so there we go. All right. So the next bit is to epoxy that on. This bit of tape here is going to hold it still while the while the epoxy dries, um, and then we can go back to maybe looking at the underneath of the of the tail cone, which uh, probably is set now, and we might see if we can get that out of the mold. Well, it's been another few hours. I've trimmed the edges a little bit. Let's see if um, see if we can get it loose. Where's my tongue depressor? The tongue depressor snapping, not the uh, not the resin. I think we're winning. Yeah. Bit of a lump there that will need sanding away and you can see the PVA release agent but it's come out it's not mega stiff but it's uh, they get these stiff enough sometimes these little nail scissors are worth their weight in gold Well, I think as you can see, that's going to work um, quite nicely. Okay, the low shroud fits nicely. I've relieved the balsa. Uh, in fact, all of this balsa is now thinned by the thickness of the, of the uh, cone. And I'm still working about how I'm going to actually attach it. And I hate to use so many screws because it makes assembling the model quite difficult at the airfield. But the majority of times, if I'm flying in the UK, which is where this is going to fly most of the time, this will remain on the model and the tailplane won't come off. So it's not a problem. But if I do need to go abroad, then this cover is going to be held on with one, two, three, four, five, ten screws. And then the cover can come off. Okay, I've not done the holes at the back yet. Uh, I'm still humming and ahhing as to what to do about this tail end section because there's no panel lines on here apart from this one. So, uh, you know, I'm trying to keep it, keep it accurate. What I thought was a panel line along here is not. It's actually a row of rivets. So um, what I'm doing is I've drilled holes and I've marked the tailplane where the holes are going to be. 
Now, this is just sheet balsa 332, I think it is, or 8th, can't remember, 332, I think. But at the back there, again, it's it's only 332, but there is at least some wood underneath there, so that's not so bad. Um, but you can't really screw into thin balsa like that. This is to, just won't hold. So the trick is to use a piece of dowel, and you make the dowel a good fit, and then you pass it all the way through to the other side of the wing, and then you cover that in glue, and then push it in, and then cut it off flush. And that gives you a hard point at which you can drill and put a very tiny screw in. Mick Reeves does some core blimey screws, which are, which are perfect for this. They're one millimeter or 0.8 millimeter screws. The one I'm going to use is, is a one millimeter by, uh, by 0.6 thread, I think. So these, these holes will get plugged with these, with these dowels. And I'll put glue on the tip, and then I'll put glue all the way around it, and then I'll put them in there. And uh, I'll probably cut them close to the right length before I push them in. And uh, once they set, I can then centre drill them, ready for the the self-tapping screws that hold this this shroud on. Then once I've got this front section on and locked, then I'll start looking at this rear end and how I'm gonna I'm gonna make it sit on there. I think the three screws I've put on the back here, or the two screws actually that I put on the back, will work. I'll have to do the same trick again with the, the dowels to harden it because this is very soft quarter, really is soft. Um, but there aren't supposed to be any screws on the back. There's no scale screws on here, but I think I can get away with it. But the, the issue is we've got to get into here to attach the linkages. So if you want to take the tailplane off, you disconnect the ball joints and then you can take the tailplane off. And obviously when you put the tailplane back, You've got to reconnect the linkages. So as you can see, it's all fitted onto the uh, to the um, lower underside of the tailplane. Now these um, little Phillips screws, these are one mil Phillips screws. They'll be countersunk a lot deeper than they are now. They're, they're sitting proud. You can see the um, the ripples in the surface. This is caused by the masking tape, or not the masking tape, the um, parcel tape wrinkling as I put it over the blue foam structure. The back is going to get sawn off right about at that join there and it'll go underneath all the way across so that the uh, the underside that that bit there that you can see in the end will stay attached to the, the glass fiber bit and then I'll put a, a wooden plug in the end a balsa plug in the end and then sand all this to shape um, there is a tail light fits in here as well and an assembly and all sorts of things so there's a lot more going on here but I just you know it's 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 roughly right so it's achieved what I wanted to achieve it's lighter than um, than if I'd use block and it's removable and the panel lines are more or less right these two screws on either side here at the back are not right but if I can sink these down um, you know much much lower into the surface they'll uh, be less obtrusive I think. This section here gets cut out there's a section for the tail wheel and there's also a section through here that gets cut out because the subject aircraft I'm doing has a has a glider tow hook um, assembly fitted which is a, a set of four pipes or beams that come back two, two from about here this way and two from up here that come back this way and then the hook assembly is back here so we've got to replicate that as well, of course. So um, so there we go. I think that was uh, interesting. If you enjoyed it, click like and subscribe. And I'll see you on the next one.